Back with Dr. Larry Crabb, the author of 66 Love Letters, From God to You, a conversation with God that invites you into his story. Ecclesiastes, hmm. pretty grim reading at times, Ecclesiastes. Um, but you, you start out by uh, quoting John Stuart Mill. He said that it's better to be Socrates, Socrates dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. <laughs> But you then have the Lord say, look, I can't make myself settle for the shallow happiness. Uh, no, no, this is you speaking to God. You say to the Lord, I can't make myself settle for the shallow happiness and contrived excitement that too many churches and most secular so uh, society provide. Now, th th this, this, this is, um, th this is a, a life examined because what you're doing as a Protestant evangelical is you're going right into the heart of the matter and saying, are we real here? Mm. Are we just making this all up? It, is everything vanity? It can feel like that. Armand Nicolai is a Harvard psychiatrist, and he's a Christian man who I've had the privilege of getting to know a little bit. We had a three-hour luncheon together a little bit ago. And in his book called The Question of God, where he compares C.S. Lewis and Sigmund Freud on their philosophies of life, mm. He makes a comment uh, talking about Harvard students. He said that it's true that Socrates said the unexamined life is not worth living, but he says so many students these days think that the examined life is too tough to live. Hmm. And that struck me as a very, a very poignant kind of a thought because one of the occupational hazards of being a psychologist, you gotta think all the time. I get sick of thinking, you know, yeah. and uh, just realizing that there's, there's a longing within my soul that will not be fully satisfied until heaven. Uh, Lewis again said uh -huh. that when you discover a longing in your soul that nothing in this world can satisfy, maybe it's time to think you were built for another world. But if there really is a longing in my soul that nothing is in this world can satisfy, then that means that I'm going to live with a feeling of emptiness. I think it's Romans 8 groaning. And I believe that when I stop fighting my emptiness and stop just going to a church to sing louder so I can feel better, and uh, focus on name it and claim it and get all the blessings that I can have and feel good. Because if you follow that path, you're going to get into pornography. Yeah. If you follow that path, you're going to get into drinking, and over drinking and doing all sorts of bad things. But if you follow the path of saying, no, wait a minute, in the core of my soul, Ecclesiastes is a real experience. In the core of my soul, there's a certain emptiness, even though I can feel joyful, even though I can enjoy my blessings and enjoy the ministry God's given me, and I do enjoy all that. But there's something in my soul, there's a desire that's so deep that only the literal presence of God when I'm with Him is going to fully satisfy. And I believe when I don't fight the emptiness and don't try to numb the emptiness, then I believe the Spirit of God transforms that emptiness into thirst. And then we become like a deer panting after the water brooks. Uh -huh. And then there's something in my soul that maybe is a little bit like the Apostle Paul who's saying, I fought the good fight, but look what's laid up for me. And he's about to die in a Roman prison. And he's telling Timothy, live like I lived. Maybe you two can get beat up and shipwrecked and end up in jail as well because it's worth it given what's coming up. And I wouldn't trade this difficulty now for the glory that awaits me, he says in Corinthians. And so I think that Ecclesiastes is kind of God's invitation to me to not try to feel better every minute of every day, but to accept however I feel and know that the day is coming when every longing in my heart is going to be fully satisfied forever. Mm. That's when the party is going to get under, underway mm. all, the, all the way. You know, as a pastor's kid growing up, I, uh, you know, we all have to grow up. Mm. I spent most of, a lot of my life at least being quite immature. Mm. I had to learn a few things. Uh, I would hear people testifying in, in public worship services and then talking to my mom and dad privately. Sometimes I'd just overhear conversations because I was hanging around the church and my dad was counseling somebody. And people would talk about a terribly dark night of the soul, a very mm -hmm. difficult time they'd gone through, a severe illness or the loss of a child or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they would talk about how during that darkness they experienced the presence of God like they'd never experienced Him in any other context before. And they would talk about the, uh, the, the, the upside, if you will, of suffering. Yeah. 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 And I used to think it was a rationalization. Mm -hmm. I used to think they're, they're just trying to wash over something. They're denying something. Uh, what I learned subsequently as a pastor dealing with some very heartbreaking situations, going through some real challenges from time to time myself, that as you say in this uh, chapter on Ecclesiastes, sometimes the way up is the way down. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's only at moments of great adversity and even a sense of hopelessness that you really discover that that, that truth of underneath are the everlasting arms. Yes. When my brother was killed in a plane wreck in 1991, 
and my parents were still living. And uh, Dad told me after that, he said that when we got the news that our, our older of two sons had been killed in a plane wreck, his words were essentially these, Mother and I, referring to his wife obviously, we held each other and had a level of closeness we had never known. Our souls met in hope. And then he said, over there in the backyard, and these were Dad's words, he said, uh, I screamed at God for 10 minutes until I realized he wouldn't repent. And then I said, God, you're worth trusting. And he said, I had a, a, an epiphany, a sense of God's presence. Now, does it last you the rest of your life? No, but when those moments come, yeah. do a dance. They're wonderful. Yeah. <sighs> Song of Songs. Over the years, it has offended people. Hmm. It has been a conundrum. Uh, the rabbis uh, wrestled with it. Uh, Church fathers wrestled with it. Christian theologians have wrestled with it. Is it a love story about physical love? Is it uh, some kind of metaphor? Is it an analogy? Is it about Christ and the church? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and so you read all this stuff. From your perspective, you're calling it a love letter to Larry Crabb. What did you learn from the Song of Songs? All of the above. All of the above. All of the above. I don't think, I think it's wrong to kind of um, falsely sanctify it right. by taking out the physical aspects, the incredible joys of physical love. I mean, sex was not Hugh Hefner's idea, it was no, God's idea. That's right. Yeah. And um, so I think he's celebrating physical love. It's rather clear in the text, yeah. it seems to me, and nothing's wrong with that. But I think what he's saying is, as I celebrate physical love, as you recognize, and anybody can relate to this to at least some degree, that there's some real excitement and pleasure in physical love and sex, God is saying, yeah, that was my plan. And can you imagine when your soul experiences that kind of pleasure at the deepest level forever? Mm. That's ultimately what's coming up, and you can have tastes of it now. You can love your wife, you can love your husband, and if you don't have a husband or wife, then sex is off limits for you. I don't think that sex is meant to be a pleasure available outside of marriage. Um, but does, it, does that mean that the single person is destined to unhappiness? No. I think the message of Song of Solomon is God is into pleasure. God is into fun. God is into love. And then we say, I don't see it. I look at the world, I look at cancer words, I look at divorce courts, and I go, God, help me know what you're doing here. And God says, you, know, you have no idea how I'm suffering until the day comes when the lessons of Song of Solomon will be lived forever. And until then, you're going to have some tastes along the way, and it could be your sex life with your spouse. Mm. Or it could be the deep connection of soul with a good friend, or the moments when you sense my presence in rich, deep ways. The Song of Solomon is God's way of saying that, yeah, Job, you're going to hurt, and uh, Psalms come out of hiding, be a community, and Ecclesiastes, it's going to be difficult. Uh, Proverbs, we forgot in there. Proverbs, there's some principles for living, obviously. Mm -hmm. But you follow all that and understand that the end of it all is incredible joy, incredible pleasure, including sexual fun here on earth. Um, the traditional view is that um, Solomon probably wrote the Song of Songs. Uh, as he did Ecclesiastes, mm -hmm. Proverbs, maybe some of the Proverbs, if not all of them. Um, a lot of wisdom coming out of a guy who really knew how to mess up. <laughs> he really did. I mean, it, 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 it's, 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 a, it's a bit of a mystery yeah. uh, that this guy couldn't practice what he preached. Or maybe when you're a king, like Bill Clinton with Monica Lewinsky said, I did it because I could. Yeah. Maybe when you're a king, you, you, you don't have inhibitions, you don't have any rules, although you've got wisdom for all kinds of other people. Yeah. Uh, there's no explanation for this, really. No, there's not. I, I get two thoughts out of it. Yeah. I think well, one, is that, um, one is that you can have a great deal of wisdom and not live up to it. That's rather clear. Solomon's certainly an illustration of that. But, but the second thing I get out of it, which to me is much, far more important for me personally, is I can be a mess and still be used of God. Mm. I don't have to get my act 100% together before I can yeah. be used of God and His purposes. And Solomon certainly didn't have his act together. Yeah. And yet God used him as a writer of certain portions of Scripture. Yeah. My goodness, maybe the kind of mess that I am. I, one of the reasons I love having my wife in the audience when I speak, she's the only person who knows what a mess I am. <laughs> and she still thinks I should be up there. <laughs> You know, and God knows the kind of mess I am way more than my wife even knows. And he still says, Larry, you're my servant. Why don't you write a book? Why don't you go talk to some people? You know, I've, I go, often, wow. I've often thought of this, that I learn more about God's love for me by examining Kathy's love for me, yeah. you know, yeah. and my own kids' love for me. Sure. I'm sure with your kids. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's a kind of an unqualified thing. Yeah. Um, 
but they see something maybe that we ourselves don't see. Yeah, and they still want us. This is uh, so encouraging, friends, and Dr. Larry Crabb is with us for uh, uh, several programs yet to come. His book is entitled, From God to You, 66 Love Letters, A Conversation with God that Invites You into His Story. 